morning, good morning. All set? So it's a pleasure to be here again to uh, bring forth the message. It's been a tough week, tough couple weeks for Bill and, and Tracy. Of course, uh, lost a church member, and then they lost uh, their future son-in-law. And then they found out the other day they lost uh, a, a neighbor. All, all passed away within, I think, 10, 10 days. And uh, he, I was with him on Thursday night, and he just was exhausted. Just needed uh, some time to um, relax and time to, to, to retreat to his place in Pennsylvania. So he asked me uh, to fill in today, and we'll know that God will, will bless uh, his word today here this morning. I want to pray, and today I want to look at uh, one of the forgotten men in, in the book of Acts that we, I don't think we look at too often, but today I want to look at him, and his name is Stephen. I want to look at Stephen this morning and what he did in his life. The first martyr of the church. Chris Stephen, we'll, we'll look at him today, and we'll see what God does. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that you woke us up. We thank you that uh, we can get here. We got here safely. We thank you that there's a place we can meet without persecution. There's a place we can meet with open Bibles and open hearts. And Lord, we thank you for today, and we thank you for all that are here. And bless this time, and we'll thank you, and we'll give you the praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Matthew 28, the Lord Jesus was telling his 11 apostles and giving them a last command and really the only command he gave to the church. And we, he calls it, we call it today, the Great Commission. I want to read it to you from Matthew chapter 28. Very famous, famous quote. Uh, ver verse here. He says in verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and in the name of the Son and in the name of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I command you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. There in verse 19, we, he says there, Make disciples. This morning, we're going to talk a lot about disciples and what that really means for us today and what that meant for the book of, in the book of Acts and for the early church and for Stephen. In verse 20, he says, teaching them all that I commanded you. It was going to be the apostles' job to take all that they've been taught throughout the three and a half years of ministry of the Lord Jesus and apply that to the new Christians that were going to be born on the day of Pentecost, and, and, and the church would begin. That is what Jesus planned for his apostles to do. He gave them that great, great commission. And he also said in, uh, in Acts chapter 1, I'm going to read that. It's, just, it's, almost a, it's the same uh, quote, but just written... Uh, in a different way. And this is important that we look at this verse. Acts 1, verse number 8. Acts chapter 1, verse number 8. He says to his apostles, uh, right before he was ascended to heaven, <clears throat> But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be my witnesses both in Jerusalem... So that's Jerusalem, the capital city. And all Judea, that's the outside of Jerusalem, that's going a little farther out. And all Samaria, that's within uh, Judah. And then Jesus says, even to the re remote parts of the earth. So we got that? The Great Commission. The Great Commission is to go to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Not just in Jerusalem, but on and on and on 
to eventually to get to Claremont. That's what Jesus meant. We're here this morning because Jesus gave that command that we would spread out. That the, that, that the, I'm sorry, the apostles would bring the gospel to the remote parts of the earth. Now, of course, they, we know the apostles were Jewish. And to them, the, the key to, Jew, to, to being Jewish is Jerusalem. And they thought, as we look through the book of Acts, that Jerusalem was the place to start and be at church. The day of Pentecost had begun, and the church was born, and the church was growing and growing and growing. One problem with that. It was growing where? It was growing just in Jerusalem. Jesus said, I want the church to grow to Samaria, to Georgia, and to the ends of the earth. And that was not happening. So Jesus had to do something about it from heaven. And this is what he did. It says in Acts chapter 6, in verse 1, Now at the time while the disciples were increasing in number, they were increasing in number in Jerusalem, of course, a complaint arose as part of the um, Greek Jews, Hellenistic Jews, against the native Jews, because of the widows were being overlooked in the daily serving of foods. They were being neglected, the widows there in the book of Acts, over tables of food. So the twelve summoned the congregation, verse 2, and said, it is not desirable for us to neglect the word of God in order to serve tables. Therefore, verse 3, select among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and of wisdom, and whom God and we could put them in charge of this task. So the church is growing in Jerusalem, and there's some problems with some widows and some serving of tables. They had to address this problem, and they did so. They got a committee meeting together, and they selected seven men of good reputation. And among those of that seven was this man named Stephen. He's actually mentioned first in verse 5. And I think man, Stephen was kind of the leader of the seven. I think he was the, uh, the, the captain of, there you go, chairman. That's a good word. He's a chairman of these seven because he's mentioned first. And I don't think he ever realized when he was chosen by the church in Jerusalem that God had specific plans for his life. He was going to, he put Stephen to put the church in a situation where his command of the Great Commission could be fulfilled. We know the problem, right? The church is to grow. The church is to expand. The church is to go on throughout the face of the earth, and it's not doing that. It's growing in Jerusalem and in Jerusalem and Jerusalem. And Stephen was picked. We'll come back and look at chapter 6 in a few minutes. But as chapter 6 goes on and in the end of chapter 6, Stephen is up to this, the forefront, being the chairman. I'm going to call him. I like that. Being the chairman, and he gets in some trouble with the, the Jewish leaders, of course. Sounds familiar. He's in trouble. He's, in for the, he's before the council in verses, uh, I think, 6 through 15 of chapter 6. And then in, in chapter 7, all of chapter 7, he gives an account of the Old Testament. He gives an account of all the... Uh, basically, he recaps the whole Old Testament. He's given a defense uh, in front of this council. And he says some things that, that they get upset about. So upset about that they rush at him in verse 54. They quickly 
gnashing their teeth at him, very interesting words, gnashed his teeth and came at him and grabbed him, and they were going to do what? They were going to stone him to death. I wonder if Stephen realized when he was picked as the chairman, as it would be, that this would end like this. End with rocks being thrown at your head. Ending in this way. He was being stoned to death. And it says in verse 56, Behold, as he was uh, dying, I would think, he saw the heavens opened, and he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 1 that Jesus is what? He is seated at the right hand of God. But because of this horrible event that was taking place, Jesus stood to welcome the first martyr of the church, to welcome him home. Actually standing in objection, but standing to welcome his, his church, his church, his first church martyr. And I think to myself, the reason why he stood, because he had a specific plan for Stephen. Remember what he said? I want my church to grow. I want my church to expand. I want my church to eventually reach Claremont. And the only way that was going to happen is they got out of Jerusalem. And the only way that it was going to get out of Jerusalem is God would have to act. Because we know how the disciples were. They're Jewish to the core. We're not going anywhere. We're staying right here. We're fine. We're content. The church is growing. Why bother to go anywhere else? Especially to those heathen Samaritans. So Jesus welcomed them home because he had a purpose for them. God was going to use Stephen to start a persecution in the church in Jerusalem. And this persecution would scatter the Christians that are in this church. It says in Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, And on that day that Stephen was, was, was killed, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. And they were scattered throughout, guess where? Regions of Judea. Sound familiar? Regions of Samaria. Unfortunately, is the apostles were not scattered. They stayed in Jerusalem. And they buried Stephen, and they had lamentations, and they were sad. But God had a purpose in this. God always has a purpose in trials and tribulations. God always has a plan. He was going to use Stephen to get the gospel to spread, to get the gospel to move, to move, to move, because God could see that it needed to reach the whole world. Now, let's look closely here at this man, Stephen. I wonder, I ask myself these questions, Lord, why did you pick Stephen? What about some of your own apostles that you had for three years? Why pick Stephen to be used as the first martyr in the church, be used to get the gospel to be spread? And here's some reasons why he picked Stephen. This man is an amazing believer. I'm not sure of his age. I'm not sure, we don't know much about him. But I discover here in Acts chapter 6 that he is a wonderful, wonderful believer. Okay, let's look at some uh, characteristics of this man. It says that the seven were going to be devoted themselves to prayer. So this man was devoted to prayer, verse 4 and into the ministry of the word. Stephen was a man of prayer. Stephen was a man of the word of God. That's the first two. 
He's a man of prayer. He's a man of the word of God. Now, that's just elementary, isn't it? Aren't we all supposed to be devoted to prayer and the ministry of the word? Not only is he, is he those two things, but he is also full, verse 3, full of the Holy Spirit. He is full of the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit just simply means he had given the Holy Spirit full control in his life. He said, Holy Spirit, whatever you want, I'll do. I want you to have full control in my life. If that means that it ends with some rocks to my head, that's what I'm going to do. That's what I'm going to do. And I think to myself, do I have that kind of dedication? Do I have that kind of a willingness, am I that filled with the Spirit to say, Lord, whatever you want, however you want it, I'm willing to do that. Are we willing? Well, Stephen was, and because he was, we're here this morning. Because God used this man to spread the gospel to the uttermost parts of the earth. And that includes us this morning. So he is devoted to prayer. He's a ministry of the word. He's full of the Holy Spirit. Not only is he full of the Holy Spirit, in verse 3 he says, he is also full of wisdom. Full of wisdom. Godly wisdom. Boy, we need that in our, in our day and age, don't we? Full of the Holy Spirit, and because he was full of the Holy Spirit, it naturally helps you to be full of wisdom when the Spirit is leading. Verse 5 says, let's look at more of Stephen. Not only is he full of the Spirit, not only is he full of wisdom, he's also, verse 5 says, Stephen, a man full of faith. I underline these words, uh, full of the Spirit, full of wisdom, full of faith. I underlie that. He's also full of the Holy Spirit, it says in verse 5. It says in verse 8 of this same man, Stephen, full of grace and of power. Boy, he has every box. We're in chapter 6, verse number 8. Acts chapter 6, verse 8. Boy, I tell you, Stephen has every box. Every box checked, doesn't he? He really does. He's devoted to prayer in verse 4. He's devoted to the word of God in verse 4. He's full of the Holy Spirit in verse 3. He's full of wisdom in verse 3. He's full of faith in verse 5. He's full of grace and power in verse 8. Not only that, he was performing great wonders and attesting miracles among the people. Verse 8. Do we see a little clearly now why Jesus picked Stephen? Now, can we be like Stephen this morning? Or is he just a Bible character that we can't reach? I know when I was growing up, and right here in that room back there during primary venture, I was taught many times by uh, good people and Bible stories, and they always seemed like heroes to me. They seemed like, well, they're Bible characters. I mean, they're not, they're not me. I mean, they didn't grow up in little old huts in New York. and they're, they're bigger than I am. Never fall for that. Stephen is no different than me and, and Tim and our great gentleman here, our veteran. He's no different than us. He's just a man that's willing to be served by God. A, will, a man that was willing to serve the church in Jerusalem. He was willing so much that God, through the Lord Jesus, was, was going to pick him to be the first martyr for the church. He was going to pick him so that Jesus' command 
that he gave on that last day with his disciples would be fulfilled. Are we willing to be used by the Lord Jesus in a ways like this? I don't think Jesus is going to, well, I hope he doesn't. I don't think he's going to ask us to be stoned. I don't think that's in our future, do you? You never know. But most likely, I don't think we're going to be stoned in our near future. But Jesus might ask us to do something else that's just as important. He might ask us to share our faith with someone that might not be here next week. And that's just as important. Jesus is just looking for some willing servants that could change history. And I don't think the night before G Stephen was going to be stoned to death, the Lord Jesus came to him in a dream or in a vision and said, Stephen, tomorrow will be your last day on this earth. You're going to be stoned tomorrow for, for standing up. I don't think Jesus said that to him. I think Stephen was just going on his daily routine of serving the Lord, standing up for what's right, and his time was picked. But Jesus standed, waited for him. And I want to go back to the, when he was stoned and look at something that happens here that I'll never forget, and we shouldn't forget either. It says in verse 57, I, I stopped at verse 56, but back in Acts 7, in verse 57, while they're stoning him, they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him in one impulse. I'm going a little back in time before they killed him. And when they drove him out of the city, they began stoning him. And witnesses laid their side their robes at the feet of a young man by the name of Saul of Tarshish. We know that name, don't we? We recognize that name. Saul is a very young person at this time. And he's holding the cloaks of the ones that were stoning Stephen so there wouldn't get blood on him. Pretty nice of Saul to do that. I tell you. And while they're stoning Stephen, verse 59, with the, Saul standing in near within hearing distance. Maybe they're stoning him here at the pulpit and Saul's over there by that window. And Saul hears these words out of the lips of Stephen. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees just seconds before he died, he said one more thing. And maybe a little louder so... That gentleman right there will hear him. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And having said that, Stephen died. The last thing he said was a prayer of forgiveness for those, the ones that were stoning him to death. I wonder why he did that. Would I do that? Praying for those who are killing me? I wonder where he learned that from. I wonder. In Acts and in Luke chapter 23, his Lord Jesus is hanging on the cross. You remember that? Acts chapter number 23. Let me look, turn back there. Let's go back to the cross now. I don't know. There's no, there's no way to know this, but maybe Stephen was somewhere in that crowd around the cross or within distance of hearing the Lord Jesus as he's dying on the cross. He says in verse 46, with a loud voice, Jesus said, Father, into my hands, I commit my spirit. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? 
Now we know where Stephen learned it from. But before that, before Jesus died, he said these words to the very men that were crucifying him. Back in verse 34. The first words that Jesus uttered from that cross. Do you remember them? Verse 34, Jesus says, looking at the Roman soldiers, looking at the Jewish people, looking at us. Because, you know, we put him there too, right? You know that, right? We put Jesus on the cross. Me. Brett Erickson did. But Jesus said, forgive them. Father, forgive them. I'm sorry. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing. Sound familiar? I guess I know where Stephen learned that from. As Stephen is giving up his life or losing his life for Christ, to the very last second, you know what he's teaching us this morning? He's teaching us to be Christ-like. He's teaching us to be like the Savior. And that's exactly what disciple really is. Disciple means to be a learner of the teacher. And the teacher is our Lord Jesus. And we are his disciples. I want to read another verse back in Luke, Luke chapter 6. And I'm sure you guys are used, he, used to it here to use a lot of verses. I want to read a verse back in Luke chapter 6. Anyone that knows Christ as Savior, you're automatically a disciple. You don't get a chance to choose. You're a disciple. If you accept him as Savior, you're a disciple. Now, if you choose to let him to be the Lord of your life, that's another thing. And many people, unfortunately, want him to be the Savior and want him to tickle our ears but not be the Lord of our lives. He wants to be Lord, not just the Savior. He wants us to be a disciple. Stephen was a disciple of the Lord Jesus. And it says in Luke chapter 6, in the verse 40th verse, a disciple, this is Jesus speaking, a disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like, his teacher. Let's put that in other words. A disciple is not above Jesus Christ. But everyone, I'm going to put my name in there, but Brett, when he has been fully trained, will be like his Lord Jesus. Is anyone else here in the midst of being trained? This training is ongoing. It never ends. You're never too old to be trained. You'll be trained until you meet the Lord Jesus, either in the air through the rapture or when you go home to be with him. So we have to think that Stephen was, at this point, by what we've seen, how he's devoted to prayer and the ministry of the word and wisdom and grace and power, he had reached the point of being fully trained. Now, of course, he didn't reach a being sinless. He still had to grow as a believer. You never stopped doing that. But he'd reached a point where he was like his master. And that's why Christ picked him. He picked him because he's just like his Lord Jesus. He had reached a point where he used to be like his teacher. Now let me ask you this morning. Is this just for Stephen? Or is it for all of us? If God's going to pick us, he's going to pick those who are being fully trained and are like the master. How Christ-like ark are you this morning? Isn't that the goal of being a believer? 
We're called Christians, aren't we? Now, this is a daily walk, isn't it? To be Christ-like is not a destination, it is a journey. And Stephen was on that journey, and he reached the point where uh, he's at the point where God said, you've done great things, and I'm going to pick you to be the first martyr of the church and to enhance the gospel. But don't take that, take that verse with you. Don't, don't forget Luke 6, 40. A disciple is not above his teacher, but everyone, when he is fully trained, will be like his teacher. I'm so glad my teacher is my Lord Jesus. He teaches me every day. In the hard days and the, the, the tough days. But I want to go back to Acts 7 again. And I want to close with a testimony that will never be forgotten by Stephen. I hope when you leave today you never forget this man. Because of what he did, there's other things he did that we haven't got to yet, and we're going to get to it right now. He prayed that prayer that would change, in my opinion, and I think the, the word of God will support that. He changed the history of the New Testament church. Not just because he, he was, be, was chosen to be the martyr and spread out the gospel, like I mentioned many times this morning, but there's another reason. And another reason comes in the way of that man that's holding the cloaks. Saul. Saul. The very next chapter, in chapter 8, it says in verse 1, or I think it's in verse 1, Saul is in hardly agreement of putting Stephen to death. In Verse 3, this is Acts 8, 3. And Saul, we know him more as Paul, but Saul, being ravaging the church, entered house by house, dragging off men and women and putting them into prison. He began the persecution that started in the New Testament church in Jerusalem. He got permission to go to Damascus to put more people in prison. He broke up homes. He had people uh, put, put to death, put in prison. He was a terror. He was a terror. Verse 9, or chapter 9, verse 1, and Saul, still breathing out threats of murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest with letters asking for more permission to throw them into jail, what he said. And while he was there, we know the story, while he was on his way to Damascus, a sudden light from heaven flashed around him, and he fell to the ground and heard a voice from the Lord Jesus saying, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. And as, the, as time goes on, we learn that the Saul, the, the persecutor of the church, will get saved. Have his name changed to, to, to Paul. And travel 8,000 miles of his day plant, planting churches, sharing the gospel, writing half of our New Testament. And we're here this morning. Because Saul was used by God. I wonder if Saul's heart would be the same if he didn't hear that prayer when he was standing over there holding those coats, when he saw a man that was truly Christ-like pray that prayer. Father, forgive them. Do not hold this sin against them. And you know, Stephen, God answered that prayer. But he didn't hold it against Saul. 
He didn't hold it against Paul. And because he didn't, Saul ended up doing all those things for God. Do you know that in Acts chapter 22, that's the, that Paul never forgot that? That prayer stuck with him for years and years and years. Acts chapter 22, after Paul had been saved, after Paul had started um, on missionary journeys and missionary troops, he's a, uh, he's a much older man, man now. He's about to go to Rome, and he's, he's given his testimony in defense of the Jews here in Acts chapter 22. <clears throat> and he said these words in Acts 22, verse 18. Acts 22, verse 18. I returned to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple, and I fell in a trance. This is Paul talking. And I saw him, him would be the Lord Jesus. And I saw him saying to me, make haste and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. And I said, Lord, this is Paul and Jesus talking to each other. Paul said to Jesus, Lord, they themselves understand that in every synagogue, after year after year, I used to imprison and beat those who believed in you. And when the blood of your witness, Stephen, was being shed by those stone, paraphrasing, I also was standing by approving. And watching out for their coats of those they were slaying here. Look at, the de- look at the detail that Paul says there. Paul is going back in time in his mind, and he can see that as fresh as day. Can't you tell in these verses? He can see it in his mind. He never forgot. That event. And I think the reason why he didn't forget it because the last thing he heard when Stephen was falling down dead was that prayer of forgiveness. And Stephen had a huge impact on Paul. He never forgot that. And he's telling the Lord Jesus here, I was there. I was in agreement. How foolish I was. Look what Saint Aust- uh, um, Augustus said about Paul and Stephen. He said this: "The church owes Paul to the prayer of Stephen." Augustine said this about. Let me repeat that. Augustine said this about Paul and Stephen. The church, which would be us this morning, owes Paul to the prayer of Stephen. Boy, God used Stephen in an amazing way, didn't he? To get the great commission fulfilled and to use a man of God that would write half our New Testament. Because one man chose to forgive. Because one man chose to be fully trained and to be like his master. To be like the Savior. We have a lot to owe to Stephen this morning. He's kind of tucked away in in the book of Acts. He's kind of, we don't really see him that much. But we have a lot to thank him for. And all he would say if we asked him, I was just being a normal Christian, being like my Lord Jesus, fully trained. I want to read it before we, we, we close in Romans 8. I want to re- read a quick verse from First Peter. We're almost done. First Peter chapter number 2. Of course, this is Peter writing this, who knew Lord Jesus very well. 
This is an amazing verse. I, ne- I have highlighted this verse. And I want to study it a little more. This is what Peter wrote about us and about being a Christian, about the Lord Jesus. He says in verse 21 of uh, 1 Peter 2, For you have been called for a purpose. Well, that's true. Maybe we weren't called to be stoned to death so the church would expand and and Paul would be uh, an amazing believer. But we are called for a purpose. Since Jesus also suffered for you, this is the rest of verse 21, leaving you an example. That word example is the only time in the New Testament it's used. The only time in the Greek New Testament. That word example, leaving you an example for you to follow in his steps. Jesus left us an example so that we'll follow in his steps. This is just elementary truths, but we forget it sometimes. And when we get in our daily lives and we have our, you know, our issues, we have, our, we have this and that going on, we forget that our jobs is to follow in the steps of the Lord Jesus. I want to be like my Savior every day. And more and more, I want to be fully trained so God can use me. And it's a willing heart. God, will you use me? Maybe I won't be stoned. But I want to be used. One place to close with this morning, and this is the will of God for every single born-again believer, everyone that knows Christ. Romans chapter 8 and verse number 29. Romans 8, 29 says this. Right after that amazing verse in verse 28, we forget verse 29. For for whom he foreknew, he also predestinated to become conformed to the image of his son. That word conformed means to be like as. Are we like as? our Savior. It is the will of God that every single believer becomes conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. And if you ask the reason why is because maybe Christ is going to come to you tomorrow with a purpose and with a question. Are you fully trained? I'm going to use you. And what you do with that will take effect what God has planned. And that's what happened with Stephen. And we're no different. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for Stephen. We thank you for his testimony. We thank you for his willing heart. That he just wanted to be used by God. Christ wants to use us all, but he's just looking for those who have that willing heart, who are willing to be trained to be like the master. Lord, make us like Stephen this morning. Give us that kind of heart. Because Christ might want to use us. We don't know what tomorrow will bring. But when we have the Savior in our hearts, everything is okay. We thank you for this time. We praise you in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen.